Today, I'm going to talk about tithing. <laughs> I was like, oh. Now, if you're new here, I got to say, um, uh, the, the last time I talked about tithing was uh, 14 years ago when we were in Malachi chapter three. That was the last time I did a whole sermon on tithing. Was, so I've only done it twice now. This will be second time t- uh, doing a whole Sunday sermon about tithing. So if you're new here, oh, not another 30 week series on tithing, you know, uh, that's not AC Creek, we don't do it that way. The reason, can anybody guess why I'm gonna talk about tithing today, anybody? It's where we're at in the scriptures. We go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And this Malachi chapter three is arguably kind of the epicenter of the the topic of tithing. And that's why uh, we're gonna talk about this. And, um, and, you know, we live in a a world that, um, you know, understandably uh, is uh, sort of weirded out by the whole topic. And um, let me just give you a few divine disclaimers uh, before we get into this. Disclaimer number one, the reason I'm talking about tithing, it's not because, number one, um, AC Creek is not broke and we don't need your money. Uh, nor does the Lord need your money. I, I want to make that clear. You know, I, I'm, I'm always saddened by these ministries that, oh, you need to give. We're going to close our doors unless you give your money. And it's like, I kind of always felt like, and I say this um, sadly and humbly, honestly, but maybe it's time to close the doors if, if the Lord's not providing. We've always kind of believed if God guides, he will provide. And it doesn't have to go through coercion or fundraising or all that stuff. Um, so that's kind of the first disclaimer. Uh, divine disclaimer number two. Uh, or let me, let me say this, by the way, uh, we're not needing money because guess what? The, Psalm 50 says, for every beast of the forest is mine. This is the Lord speaking and cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Man, the Lord's lacking for nothing. He doesn't need us our money. But we will talk about tithing, uh, but it's not because atheists broke. It's not because the Lord needs your money. Number two, I want you to know that I'm aware of the abuses around this topic. Um, we've seen a lot of wacko stuff for coming from the church and oftentimes from what I would might even say the so-called church uh, in this area of giving and tithing. It's just gotten weirder and weirder. Maybe you saw a while back um, in Florida, the lotto tithe. Um, this one church had this stupid program or you'd put your check in the bucket as it went by, and then they'd put it in a big uh, th- roller up on the stage, and they'd roll all the checks, and then they'd reach in and grab one out, and whoever got picked, they would have that money times two returned back to them. Uh, and uh, they're like, you're the winner, and all this stuff. Uh, to me, that's just totally wacko, but maybe a little less wacko than this, uh, the Christian Post article that came out recently, um, $188 million Powerball winner Marie Holmes is allegedly being sued by a local pastor for $10 million. A local North, North Carolina pastor um, is suing uh, this 27-year-old mother of four, uh, Marie Holmes, for $10 million uh, on reneging on a verbal promise to give him $1.5 million of her winnings. Um, The local pastor, Kevin uh, Matthews, describes experiencing emotional and mental distress after (laughs) Holmes changed her mind about giving him 1.5 million to help him build his retreat center. Um, And he says, quote, because the emotional distress and mental stress they put me through, I had to start taking more medicine for anxiety and depression due to the situation. And uh, I believe that guy should be fired today uh, and um, maybe put in counseling. Um, but, um, but all that to say, um, there's all kinds of abuses around this idea of tithing and Benny Hinn and all these people, that, you know, take your money and they'll, you know, if you send your thousand dollar gift, I'll pray for you. No, a pastor should just pray for people. Uh, and it should do it for free, by the way. Uh, it's so ridiculous. All this stuff, planting your seed of faith and all this, this mumbo jumbo that people say and do. I understand the abuses and hopefully I'll be able to clear up some of that, how it really is supposed to be, uh, according to the Bible. Um, And then also one thing that you should know um, is athe pastors do not know how much you give. Um, This is something that I've kind of decided and prayerfully thought through when we first started Athe Greek. And there's a reason for that. And I've been told by some of our wealthier givers, they're like, Brett, you should know who gives in the church. And I always like to say, um, why? Why should I know that? And they say, well, you know, because, you know, if you want to have responsible giving and you want to see the growth and all this stuff and this and this, they have all their reasons and stuff. But you know, the problem is I feel like um, this understanding of who the big givers are, it corrupts our pulpit. Right? you don't have a pulpit. 
Oh, okay. It corrupts the stool. Um, <laughs> If, if, if we, you know, there's, I've seen it in other ministries where pastors will, oh, there's a big giver. I, whatever I do, I can't offend that person today because he might not give his big donation. And, and it gets just corrupt and it gets really weird. And by the way, um, there, there's also this expectation wealthy people have that I should, know, I should have a little more access to the pastor or to the team or to the parking space or the etched window glass with my name on it or the bathroom stall with my name on it, whatever. Uh, and that's just not really the way it should be. Um, in fact, um, um, that's just evil actually. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us about that. You know, um, it says there in James chapter two, listen to this. He says, my brothers show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes to you in your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, your pastor. Um, no, I'm sorry, uh, verse three. And if you pay attention to who the one, the one who wears the fine clothing and say, ooh, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Um, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's a rhetorical question that is, that's evil. It's evil to do that. Um, and so one of the things about Athey Creek is we wanna be really careful not to show this weird partiality. I want, maybe you saw one of the documentaries on Discovery Plus recently about a big church that's failed again, uh, you know, moral failure on a lot of different levels. But one of the things I saw that I couldn't believe is they actually had VIP seating where they, you know, people would be brought in the back and they'd escort them to the special seats and, and you know, and then Justin Bieber would show up. Oh, fancy seat and stuff like that. Um, by the way, we, we really don't roll that way at Athey. We wanna be all just a bunch of normal people together. Um, now that he's in heaven, I'm gonna say this, but um, one of my favorite Athey Creekers of years ago was uh, Jerome Kersey. If you guys didn't know that, he was, he'd always sit over here, uh, him and his family, and uh, we always loved Jerome. Uh, but Jerome would say, Brett, you don't understand. I love Athey Creek for a lot of reasons, but he said, one reason is because nobody treats me like a big superstar. Um, and he literally would just uh, come in and could come and go and nobody was like trying to get his autograph and stuff. And they just kind of let him be a normal church guy. And um, that was kind of cool. He, he, he loved that. He also loved through the Bible and stuff like that. I remember when I had the honor of doing his memorial service, um, just how the Lord uh, just really blessed that man and his love for the Lord. But I was glad that Athey Creek could be a place for a guy like that to not come and feel like he had to be treated fancy or special or, or things like that. Um, that was kind of the way it worked. And we've had that in, at Athey Creek. So be careful if you're wondering, why, has it, why didn't Brett write a thank you note when I gave my special love gift? Uh, yeah, the answer, I didn't know you give it. <laughs> well, then what good is it? Well, that's what this sermon's about today. Um, by the way, uh, another verse that, um, you know, Matthew chapter six, Jesus taught this um, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when, not if, but when thou doest alms or give, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth, uh, that thine alms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Uh, the reward of giving comes from God, not from the pastor not getting your parking space uh, or anything like that. The reward comes from God. And by the way, just so you can remember, if somebody comes up and pats on, hey, thanks for that nice gift you gave us, that's your reward right there. So there at the Bema Seat Judgment, you're getting your you know, rewards for the works you've done. And you're like, oh, wait, they're gonna wait till that time I gave that big dollar amount, you know, and you're trying it by fire. You know the, the judgment I'm talking about? You try it by fire, and whoosh, there it goes, it's burned up. Wood hand stove, you're like, whoop, put the, no, remember that guy patted you on the back for that. That's what you got for that reward. That's all you got. There is your reward. But, but if you do it secretly, you know, um, then the Lord says, I will reward you openly. Um, uh, and then divine disclaimer number four, um, this is a message for Christians. If you're not a Christian, man, you should not feel, and, and nor should you donate money to a church. Um, giving money is not really giving it to a church. You might think that, but it's actually, as Christians, we believe we're giving back to the Lord that which is his. And so there's no reason for you to give. You shouldn't give if you're, if you're um, from a, you know, just a non-believer kind of perspective. Please don't feel that at all. No, we wouldn't want you to give. Also, by the way, if you're visiting from another church, I'm gonna just tell you right now at this point, um, don't feel like you need to give here. I'd say give your tithe, especially to the church you attend and, and don't let it go away from there. Uh, and I'll give you a reason, by the way, for that. 
Um, but, but the idea of the giving and the tithe, the offering is what Malachi is gonna bring up here. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna see what it really is meant to be. You know, some of you uh, have a real joy um, of shopping. And when you buy something, you get a, a joy out of that, you know. Um, you know, you, some of you, like me, you go to the grocery store and you're, you're like, you have money in your pocket and then you get to the ice cream aisle and then you get to the Ben and Jerry's, you say, oh, I can't have that anymore, they're too woke. Um, and so you, you go to the Christian ice cream, the Dove Bar. Um, <laughs> and you, you, you know, as you buy it, you're like, oh, this is gonna be great. Or some of you are, are shopping addicts, some of you go to Nordstrom, some of you, a, a certain group, and all the guys are like, yeah, Brett, preach it, brother. Or how about that heavenly hardware, the Home Depot? As you're walking through the toy, I mean the tool uh, idle, I mean aisle, uh, and you're walking through there and you, you see that compressor that you just have to have. And your wife's like, honey, you already have one of those things. And like, oh, but that only does, you know, two pneumatic tools at a time. I need something that'll do four. Like you have a crew in your backyard framing up a, a, a building. But anyway, I digress. But when you buy that compressor, oh, the dopamine flows. And it's like, oh, I just got, and there's something about joy when you're doing that. Wouldn't it be something if giving was connected to that when you give to the Lord, it had that same, like, I get to do this. That's the thing that uh, we really wanna get to uh, is that we actually become mindful of that, that when we give of our, our, our resources to the Lord, it's not a got to, it's a get to, and we'll get into that. So let's see what happens here in Malachi chapter three, verse seven is where we'll pick it up. It says in verse seven, Malachi three, even from the days of your fathers, you were gone away from mine ordinances and I've not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall, be, shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Ha. Radical statements here. Um, and what an important topic here. Um, you know, the idea of tithing. Now, um, let's, let's get into this. Let's do a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, uh, the first thing you can jot down in your notes is first of all, the Lord points out the need of the people. In verse seven, he, he kind of calls them out. He says, you know, you need to return to me and I will return to you. And then they say, wherein should we return to you? Do you sense a little bit of an attitude from the people here? If you were with us on Wednesday night, it started out egregiously horribly, uh, where in chapter one, the Lord says, I have loved you. And the people said, wherein have you loved us? And most of us, even if you're a nominal Bible student, you can say, well, how about when the Lord opened the Red Sea so that you could go through and get away from Egyptian's army? How about when manna fell from heaven? How about when he delivered you from being slaves in Egypt? Like you, I could list a hundred things that the Lord did lovingly toward the Jews, but here are the Jews in Malachi's time at the end of the Old Testament period. There's in, when did you love us, God? Um, and then the Lord says, and, and, and you know, you've, you've dishonored and despised my name. Wherein have we despised your name? And, and that's the attitude of the people. And this sort of discourse goes on and on through this book. But then it gets to this section we're reading this morning. And the Lord says, you know, man, I, I want you to return to me. How do we return to you, God? And the Lord says, here's how. And he gives us this whole dissertation on their tithe and their offering. The need of the people was to return to the Lord. That's what we read in verse seven. Return to me and I will return back to you. Um, and, um, and, and isn't it interesting that the idea of being with the Lord and returning to the Lord, one of the measurements that's associated with that is this idea of your money and giving. 
And the Lord calls him out on it. And he says, man, you need to give of your tithe and offering. That's how you return to me. Um, even Jesus talked about this, by the way, on the, uh, again, on the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus said this, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. Whatever you put your money, energy, effort, time, uh, resources into, that's what you're gonna love. That's a principle, both good and bad. It's a good thing to remember. Some people, their treasure is some hobby or some sport or some, you know, they pour all their money, time, energy into something and they can be in love with it more than they love their own wife. A young couple, oh, we've fallen out of love. I don't love him anymore. Well, the answer is to reinvest your treasure. That which you value, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. But Jesus, of course, is talking here about, you know, all your stuff. Invest it into heaven and your treasure will be in heaven. Your treasure will be toward the Lord. And it's an important thing. Um, uh, now, some of you might say, well, that sounds kind of materialistic to have stuff be related to what you love. But it actually puts um, sort of, it's not just loving in word. There's something that makes it start to be deeds as well. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a newly married young couple and the young man on her birthday, he comes to her and gives her a hug and a kiss and says, honey, happy birthday. I didn't get you a present. And here's why. We are just so in love and I love you so much. I just know that we're above that. I don't need to give you a present on your birthday. And she might say, hmm. <laughs> and then Valentine's Day comes and, and the husband comes up and gives her a hug and says, hi, honey, happy Valentine's Day. But you know, I didn't get a card because it's just a Hallmark holiday and it's an invention of, you know, uh, it's just, you know, our love doesn't need to be bolstered by Valentine's Day. And then Christmas rolls around and the tree has presents, but not from the husband to the wife because he comes up, Merry Christmas, honey, and I didn't get your present because our love, you know. And, and at this point, I'm gonna give the young man advice. And here's the advice I'll give, duck because you got something coming that you probably deserve. Why is that? Because there's something about investing in things that you value into someone um, will actually sort of demonstrate a certain love for that person. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And we feel that in marriage, but the Lord sort of is articulating that in our relationship with God. Um, you know, and, and I know that there's some Christians that were willing to offer song and we're willing to even offer, offer service, but are we willing to offer our substance and the, the, the things that we value the most to the Lord as an offering to the Lord? It was D.L. Moody, that famous preacher from a few generations ago that said, I can see more about the spirituality of a man by reading through his checkbook than I can by reading through his prayer book. And I think there's truth to that. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about as well. So you have, you know, number one, you have the need of the people and that is to return to the Lord. And um, this had to do with their heart toward their, their money and their resources. Um, and that brings us to the second part of this uh, discussion of Malachi, the sin of the people. What were they doing? Well, it says there in verse eight, rhetorically he asked, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. And then they said, wherein have we robbed thee? You know, um, and the answer is, he said, the tithes and offerings, which tells us something of the Jews of the Old Testament when they held back their tithe and their offering, they were keeping that which God deemed as his own. You've robbed me of something that's actually of mine. In other words, the tithe was the Lord's for the people of the Old Testament. Um, but he also includes the offering in that, which I think is interesting because those two words are really important in this discussion. He says, you, you know, the tithe and the offering you've robbed me from. Um, let's, let's, let's look at those words a little closer. The word tithe in the Hebrew is maser, which means um, one-tenth. That's really a simple word. Uh, maser means, um, you know, the fraction, one-tenth or a tenth part. The word offering is the Hebrew terumah, 
which means contribution, a present of sacrifice or tribute or a gift that's over and beyond sort of the tithe. It's something that is a free will offering. Maybe you're familiar with that term in the Old Testament where somebody just willingly says, I wanna give over and beyond. I'm just gonna willingly give this as unto the Lord. That's the, the terumah, uh, the, the free will offering. Um, and the Lord says, you have robbed me in keeping these things, the tithe and the offering, the ma'aser and the terumah. You've kept them from me. Um, you might say, now, Brett, I got it. That's great. You've given a lesson on tithing. But this is the Old Testament. And I know this, is the, this, this idea of tithing. And even this word Malachi, he even said it, uh, that you're, you've not kept my ordinances. Verse seven, this is, this is from the law. And they weren't keeping the laws of tithing. And, and we are not under the law. Uh, and, and I would say that is exactly right. I hope you get that from today's lesson. Uh, did you know that we are not under the Old Testament law when it comes to tithing? Uh, that's an important thing to know. Um, now some of you are like, oh great, I don't have to give it all. Um, well, let's, let's hold that thought for a second. Um, but the Old Testament law, we don't keep. We are no longer under the law. I've done whole sermons on that many, many times over. Um, and you, should not, you and I should be really glad about that. Uh, it's funny how we pick and choose sometimes the Old Testament laws. I've had moms drag their teenage boy up to me. Come on, Pastor Brett, tell them why the Bible says you're not supposed to mark your body with a tattoo. Tell them, Brett. And I always feel bad because I, I think the mom's gonna be disappointed with my answer. Because, you know, if I were being smart aleck, which I never am, um, I would say, well, can I see a picture of your husband, ma'am? Um, and and, and she, if she showed me, I'd say, now, why has he shaved the corners of his beards? Why does he have these long strands of spit curl hairs right here and here? Um, because if you're gonna, the verse right above where it says not to mark your body in the Levitical law, it also says that men are not supposed to cut the corners of the beards. That's why the Jews walk around with really long sections of hair right here. It's not a great look if you ask me, um, but I'm no fashion Easter to say the least. But, um, but, but see, the point is, you, you know, you're not supposed to uh, do that if you're keeping the law of the Old Testament, which none of us can keep. And oh, by the way, how'd your son even make it here today? Has he ever been disobedient? Um, well, yeah, all the time. Well, then why isn't he dead? The law says, if your son is disobedient, take him outside of the town and stone him to death. Mom, you're not keeping the law. You better watch out on this one. Now that would be the smart aleck, me. I would never say that to her, but I would say to her, um, you can't make a, a rule out of tattoos because of the Old Testament law. There's a bunch of laws. Um, I, I, I'm successful in a lot of them. Like I don't eat bats. Uh, that's something I don't do. I'm victorious in that law. Uh, there's a bunch of things you can, we can talk about. But my point is, uh, be careful on this one. So yeah, I wouldn't say that the reason anybody should give of their tithe or offering to the Lord is because of the law. Um, but then the question is, should we even consider that then? Or is it something we should think about? I think the answer is yes. And I'll tell you why um, I was raised, and I had to kind of work through this um, later on in my life because I was raised before I can remember giving my tithe and offering. When I was a tiny little child, my mom and dad taught me what the tithe was. My mom would do fun stuff like she'd give all three of us kids 100 M&Ms and we'd get ready to eat those M&Ms. My mom was, wait, what, what? 10 of those M&Ms out of the 100, they belong to the Lord. And she would give us little mini lessons. Like we're I'm like two or three. And, um, and so she'd make us count out the 10 and then we'd give it back and we were gonna give that, wrap it up and give it to one of our friends, you know, that as unto the Lord, a gift. And, um, and then we'd say, but mom, I like M&Ms. And my mom would say, well, look, you have 90 M&Ms left. That's probably more than your dentist actually wants you to have. Um, you're blessed to have 90. And we're like, oh yeah, I guess that's true. Um, and we learned this lesson very, very early. So the, by the time I got my first paycheck as lawn mowing, uh, you know, I'd get a dollar, my mom would pay me in dimes. Now, nine of those dimes are yours, but one of those dimes you're supposed to put in your pocket, you know, as a six-year-old kid, and you bring that and drop that in the offering at church. And she taught me from the very, my mom and dad taught me that from the early, I can't even remember how far back that goes. So it just became really natural for me so, you know, when I earned my first $500 for, you know, bucking hay and building a fence and stuff, you know, I didn't look at that $500 check uh, for a whole summer of work. Um, I didn't look at that as mine. I looked at the $450 as mine and the 50 goes to the Lord. 
Um, you know, it's, it's a funny thing how you, you, um, you kind of get a place where it's not even a thought. It's just something you do. And, it's, it's, and I was raised just to know that part's of the Lord's. It's not even a question. I'm really thankful for that. But then as I became more, uh, you know, astute to what the Bible was teaching on tithing, I had to kind of resolve, why do I do this? Am I doing it just because my mom taught me that? Because I knew it was an Old Testament law thing and we're no longer under the law. But the Lord has shown me why it's a good idea to, to tithe for me. And I wanna encourage you to pray about this yourself. The first thing is the Lord showed me and reminded me is that the, the, the tithing practice actually precedes the law. Did you know that? Before the law was even given, there's a great story in Genesis 14, verse 18, where Abraham goes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and brought forth bread and wine. Bread and wine is a picture of what? Communion. And this Melchizedek, who was a king, was also the priest of the Most High God. Is there something weird going on here already? If you're a Bible student, you know Melchizedek being a king, but also a priest, something's up here. Because the Bible kind of forbids that unless, unless this king and priest happens to be Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can be prophet, priest, and king. But you got this guy, Melchizedek, who's a king and a priest, and he, Melchizedek, verse 19, blessed him, Abraham, or Abram as he was called then, and said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him, that is, Abraham gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. All of his possessions, Abraham gave one-tenth. Uh, that's that, that uh, word that we mentioned earlier, tithe, one-tenth of all of his possessions. So interesting, there's a model of Abraham. And, and, and now, if you know your Bible, um, the, the priest Melchizedek, we realize from the book of Hebrews that that actually is a beautiful picture and type of Jesus Christ. Some would go as far and say as it was a, a Christophany, a, a, an Old Testament appearance of the pre-incarnate Jesus. And that's why the book of Hebrews says Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. I just filled you in. That was a freebie for you today. You know the priesthood of the Melchizedekian order today. Uh, you're like, wow, bro, that's great. Um, but that's the thing. The tithe was instituted right there long before the law was ever given. Now, all that to say, um, you know, um, we're supposed to, you know, if, if we're looking at the tithe in the Old Testament, what part of their stuff were they supposed to give? Were they to look at all their stuff? If you had to pick out the stuff you were gonna give out of the tenth, what was your part that you were supposed to pull out? The best, the first fruits, the best fruits. Yeah, but Brett, that's my blue ribbon prize winning 4-H sheep. Exactly. That's the one you give to God. Uh, the best of your fruit, the best of your crops and your herds and flocks and what have you. Um, can I remind you of the people of Malachi? If you were, if you were here during Wednesday night study, the Lord said, you bring your lambs, uh, Malachi chapter one, verse eight. And he says, if you offer, speaking of the sheep, the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it to your governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. He's saying, man, you guys wouldn't even, if the governor came to your house, you wouldn't even give him the lamb that you're giving to me as a sacrifice. Um, because they were bringing the scabbed, the scurvy, the sick, the diseased. Oh, let's give God the worst that, you know, that we have. Um, and they were supposed to give, but they gave begrudgingly. That's where the people of Malachi's day were. They not only were robbing God of the tithe and offering, but when they brought their sacrifice, they'd say, find some old crippled, broken down old lamb and let's give that one to God. They were giving begrudgingly. That's not the way we're supposed to give. It should be that joyful, man, I get to give the best to the Lord. That's why 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, nine, verse seven, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or word begrudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. That's, that should be the, the, the heart behind giving. When you give of your substance to the Lord, it's supposed to be cheerful. Um, I love the, the, this is a fun translation. The word cheerful is the Greek word hilarion. Can you imagine what word we get from hilarion? Hilarious. The Lord loves a hilarious giver. 
<laughs> Brett, we need like a comedian to come to church and uh, somebody who's a little hilarious. No, the idea is that there should just be a hilarity when you're giving. Like, oh, I just love that I get to do this. <laughs> this is awesome. Not, oh, I got to give to the Lord again. I would say if that's your attitude, you might as well keep your money because you're, mess, you're messing with the whole purpose of giving is to be an act of worship and something that should be joyful and something that is meant to be a blessing. Um, so, so some people, if you're, if you're stuck on that, Brett, I think tithing is of the Old Testament law and I don't wanna give because I'm not under the law. Well, then that's great. Uh, I would say that's correct. You don't and you shouldn't give. Uh, and, and if it's something that's begrudging, don't do it. That's why at Athey Creek, we, we don't have a formal membership that tracks your tithe record. Um, <laughs> I know churches do that. Uh, some get a little weird about this. I've, I've heard, the, even the Mormon church, I've heard if you're part of the Mormons, if you don't show up and you don't tithe, they'll be at your door, like, kuk, 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 nog, and, uh, we noticed uh, your tithe record. Uh, we don't do that at Athey Creek because we sort of feel like that misses the whole point. Um, should we be knocking doors, uh, people that talking or aren't tithing? The answer is no. Uh, it should be driven personally by your relationship and your love for the Lord. It's not a get, a got to, it's a, it's a get to. Um, by the way, um, on this issue of the Old Testament law, here was another thing that nudged me as a young man to realize, nah, I think I'm gonna just keep tithing like I've always done. Not because I'm compelled by the law to do it. It precedes the law with Abraham and Melchizedek. But also Jesus really said something that's kind of interesting if you piece this one together in Matthew 23, 23. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders who are a bunch of hypocrites. He says, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, which is the scriptures, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done. But notice the last thing Jesus tacks on at the end, and not to leave the other undone. What's he talking about there? Anybody? What's he saying? Don't leave the other undone. The tithe. It's funny, he says, you guys tithe of your, see these Pharisees and scribes, they'd get out their, you know, uh, spice, you know, counter stuff and lay it all out there and they'd pour their cumin out. I don't even know what cumin is, uh, but they'd pour it out on the table and go, okay, one piece of cumin for God and nine pieces of cumin for me. And they'd get all their spices all divvied out and the people go, wow, they're so spiritual. They're amazing. Uh, but Jesus is like, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You get your tithe all dialed in with your spices for crying out loud, but you're not even showing good judgment or mercy or the weightier matters of faith. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're a bunch of hypocrites. These you ought to have done, mercy, judgment, and faith. And then Jesus said, and not to leave the other undone, the idea of tithing. I think that's interesting because in the New Testament, you know, you hear Jesus saying this. It kind of makes us New Testament Christians realize, wow. Um, we know the Bible talks about a cheerful giver, uh, but he says, don't leave the other undone in reference to the tithe. I think that's interesting for me. So Brett, you have chosen to use the tithe as your unit of measure for giving, even though it's an Old Testament law thing? Yes, because of Melchizedek. Yes, because um, of uh, Jesus' statement here, don't leave that other undone. Um, but again, I wouldn't die on the battlefield saying you have to give one-tenth. Um, I, I would say that's, that's, that is to being legalistic, but it's a good rule of thumb. Brett, I'm more of a New Testament kind of Christian. I like the New Testament. Oh, let's see what the New Testament's model of giving is. Let's go to Acts chapter four and check this out. This is Acts chapter four. And it says there, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Verse 33, and, he, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked they weren't missing out on anything. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. There's the New Testament model. Sell everything and you bring it to the church leadership's feet and drop it down. Do you guys wanna go with that model? 
Why, now, why don't we do that model? I'll tell you why we don't do that model. I'll just tell you, I'll be honest with you. Because the church was in a unique situation back in those days. Why was the, by the way, what is this? There's a name for this. Anybody wanna boldly say what that is? Anybody? Socialism or communism even. This is communism. Now, by the way, I'm gonna say something that's gonna freak some of you guys out. Communism would be a wonderful, amazing form of government. It really would, except for one problem, sin. You put communism with people who happen to be sinful, and then you get massive corruption and evil. Um, but that's true with any form of government, by the way, even capitalism or, you know, like, uh, you know, like it's funny how wherever you add people in the mix, it, it, it makes things ugly. Why was this working? The answer, it was working because they were under massive persecution at this time. The Roman Empire and the various you know, emperors that came through 10 waves of Roman persecution on the church. And the church was running for their lives. Like, like there was a day where these Christians for just believing in Jesus and saying Jesus is Lord, they would dip them in hot wax and burn them to death and then hang them on the street like street lights and light them on fire. That was a, that was a tough day as, as being a Christian back in those days. So the church, they were living in very scary times. So they had all things in common. They sold all their possessions and brought it all together. And they, they survived by loving for and caring on one another. This was sort of communism in a way that was actually where the sin part was taken out because they were, they were being persecuted. Wherever you see persecution, you oftentimes see purity. Interesting enough. But I don't believe this is a model. You could make it your model if you want sell all your possessions and give it to the church. Um, by the way, uh, along with this chapter, uh, we also have the story in Acts chapter four of a little couple named Ananias and Sapphira. They were seeing this go on where everybody was giving of their possessions. And so Ananias said, hey, well, let's do that. We'll sell our possessions, but we'll keep some for a rainy day for us. And we'll keep some, of, but we'll tell them we're giving all of our possessions. So Ananias comes walking into Peter and sets down all of the stuff and says, here's our possessions. And Peter says, all of your possessions? And Ananias says, yep, everything. <clears throat> he falls down dead. Um, and they drag him out, you know. And Sapphira comes walking in a little later and is like wondering where Ananias is. But she brings and says, here's the rest of it. Ananias and I, we sold all, here it is. And Peter says, all of your possessions? Yes, it is. <clears throat> she kicks over dead. Um, man, aren't you glad the Lord doesn't move like that in his church today? That was a, a, a good lesson for us, but man, uh, you know, can you imagine on a Sunday us all singing, I surrender all. I surrender most. <laughs> like, it, it would not be so good. Um, but that's what happened in that day because they were not doing, they were not being honest before the Lord about their giving. But this is where the tithes start looking, looking a lot better to me. Uh, it's just one-tenth. It's not all of your possessions. It's just one-tenth. And it's a nice little model for us to use. And that's the way I look at it. For me, it's a good place to start giving to the Lord a tithe of all that I um, make and all that I earn. And it's, it's what I've been doing since I was a little kid. Now, um, uh, be cautious. I think that there should be um, intentional giving, whether it's a tithe or not. Some of you give a five. What's a five? A uh, $5 bill in the offering once in a while. You walk by, oh, here, do the five. We'll keep the lights on for you here at Athey Creek. Give your five. Now, if $5 is uh, one-tenth of what you make, then that's great. And your heart needs to be right on that, and that's great. And the Lord will bless that. But if you're thinking that you're just gonna kind of try to help out by throwing a little, I, I'm not sure that's really the heart behind giving. And I don't think God really is interested in that. God wants to develop in his people an obedience uh, especially in the area of giving. Um, and I think that's pretty important. So you got the tithe, which is the 10th, the offering, which is a free will offering over and beyond. So how does the church do with this, generally speaking, in the area of giving? Well, as it turns out, the studies, the average Protestant, uh, he gives only 3% of his income to the church, who attends church regularly. 3% is the typical average. Um, did you know that uh, the average church attender in America spends more money on the care and the feeding of their pet than they do for uh, you know, giving a tithe or offering to the Lord in the United States? In 1955, um, Americans spent 7% of their income on luxury items. 
In 1995, Americans spent 35 to 40% of, of their income on luxury items. And then uh, in 2017, they had to split it up because the gap between the wealthy and the poor, there were some different readings on this one. And what it was, the, the poorest of Americans in two, 2017, they were still at about 40% of their income spending on luxury items. That was the poorest people in America. 40% of their income on luxury items. Um, but the wealthy were spending closer to 60% of their income on, on luxury items. The point that I'm making is, you know, we as Americans, we like spending money on things we really want. And we've kind of decided, well, those are things we need. And, um, and as it turns out, the, the stats tell us that basically people are not uh, generally giving. Um, you know, at AC Creek, about 30% of the people that attend our fellowship are the people that are t actively, uh, regularly tithing. About 30% is the number, um, which we're thankful for those. Uh, those givers that are givers of tithes and offering um, are the ones that really do kind of keep things going here at Athe and help us with, uh, you know, missionary uh, works that we're doing in Vanuatu and Brazil and other places around the world. Um, having a really cool youth group and things going on. Uh, we just had a hundred of our high schoolers uh, head to Mexico at two o'clock this morning. They left um, and they're gonna be down there doing some great work down in Mexico. Um, our youth group, man, when I was a youth pastor back in the old days, you wanna know what my budget was? Zero. Tad and I had a zero dollar budget and we had to kind of figure out how to do stuff for free uh, with our youth ministry. Now this starts to introduce something that's interesting about um, you know, some, some things that are, you know, some of you are not gonna like, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Um, th th after, after we see, you know, first of all, the need of the people, they need to return to the Lord, the sin of the people, they were keeping their money from the Lord. Then the Lord gives the remedy to the people about how they fix this problem. And the first thing that he says is right there in verse 10, the verse part, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. This is where the tithe goes. In the Old Testament, the storehouse was a place where the food was kept. And then the people would divvy out the food from the storehouse and take care of the community from the storehouse. That's the Old Testament model. Um, in the New Testament, the Bible calls the word of God the food, if you would. And it's the place where people are fed. The storehouse, you know, the, the storehouse in this context meant the temple, right? God's house. If you read verse 10, bring ye the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house right? Meet in mine house. That means the temple. So in the New Testament, that temple ministry moved to more of a church context where the church was where the tithe was supposed to be. So the storehouse in the Old Testament, temple, the storehouse in the New Testament was the church, even as they would lay their tithes and their money down at the apostles' feet. Now, this is important because what is the church? Some of you say, well, the church is all people who are Christians in the world. And there's a certain truth to that. But you also have to understand God recognizes three institutions in the world. He recognizes government, he recognizes the family institution, but he also recognizes the church of Jesus Christ. And the church has leadership according to God and leadership is elders, deacons, and I hate to say the word bishops, but the word bishop is episkopos in the Greek. Um, and it's, a, it's an elder in the church who's also probably pastor, but, but more of an administrative kind of elder, uh, the episkopos. So there's three major roles. And a church is made up of those leaders, a group of episkoposes and, uh, you know, and elders and, and deacons leading the congregation. That's the organization that God recognizes. So when it comes to bringing your tithe, you need to make sure that you're bringing your tithe to a place where the church is structured, organi organized. Brett, I'm not into organized religion. Well, you're not into what God actually said needs to happen. You're actually rebelling against God's plan when you say, I don't like organized religion. I understand there's been abuses of organized religion, like I said earlier, um, and those are not legitimate churches, nor should you give your tithe and offering to a church that's doing uh, you know, um, lotto tithe. Uh, you probably shouldn't give your money there, just a heads up. Uh, I think a lot of you are smarter than that anyway, uh, hopefully. But, um, but there, there's a lot of interesting thing that's happened in these last hundred years or so um, with a lot of wacko churches and the prosperity gospel and all that. People just kind of said, we're gonna give our money wherever we kind of feel like it. And so a lot of nice, wonderful organizations, parachurch organizations are getting people's tithe and offering. I don't think that's actually the biblical model. 
Um, I believe that the, the model goes, the tithe goes to the storehouse. That's the church, the organized church. Um, the church where you're fed, wherever you're fed, that's, that's why at the beginning when I told you if you're visiting here from another church, don't give your tithe here at Athey Creek. Um, you're just a visitor here and we're glad you're free from tithing from here. You don't need to do that. But I would say, go make sure at home and, and um, you know, give where the, the, the church you attend, where you're fed is where your tithe, I think, belongs. Now your offering is that free will and you can do whatever you want with that. That's where, you know, AC Creek, we actually give offerings as a church to other organizations. We, we, we love to give money to um, Young Life and to FCA and we've given, you know, offerings to other churches that, uh, you know, could use a boost. We've done that at AC because we, we love doing that stuff. And, and personally, Debbie and I do that too. The tithe is locked in, we tithe to the church that we attend. Um, but we also like to give of our offering to those other parachurch organizations or whatever we want to do there. That's kind of the way the Lord works it out. So it's the tithe belongs in the storehouse. That's part of the remedy that God says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Um, and, um, and then the Lord says something interesting about once you give of your tithe, he says, put me to the test. Uh, he says here in verse 10, bring my, the tithe of the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And he says, and prove me now herewith. I love the ESV on this one. It basically says, the Lord says, and thereby um, put me to the test, saith the Lord of hosts, um, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. This is what the Lord promises that he, he should do. So we've got the, where should we bring our tithe? The storehouse, that's the church. Um, um, and the Lord says, test me on this one. Um, and, and then he says, um, uh, he also tells us in the Bible when we should give. Interestingly enough, you can jot this down in your notes. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul says, I don't want to see a collection uh, plate going by when I'm there. But do that on the first day of the week. Now, for you guys that know this, what, what was the first day of the week of, of those people in those days? Sunday. Saturday was the Sabbath for them. And that's when the synagogues were full, Sabbath day on Saturday. But the church started meeting early in their forming on, on Sunday morning. Why did they switch from Saturday to Sunday? Anybody? Hello? The resurrection of Jesus. Jesus rose on a Sunday morning. Plus the synagogues were still full on, on Saturdays. So the, the, the church started meeting and, and using the, some of the buildings and the facilities and even the temple to gather on, it'd be like our Monday. It'd be like, hey, can we use your church on Monday? Cause nobody's there. Uh, that's, that's what actually happened in the early church. We're gonna start on Sunday. So, so he says the first day of the week, when you gather um, together, that's when you collect the tithe and offering. And the reason I point this out, this idea, idea of the first day of the week and why that's important is because it's part of the worship that we do. When we gather together, it's part of an act of worship. Um, and so when you give, make sure that you're giving with a heart. Say, Lord, this is an act of worship because I love you. And there's that joy. There should almost be that same feeling when you buy the new compressor at Home Depot um, or the new shoes at Nordstrom for some of you that do that sort of thing. Um, you can just go, I can have joy when I say, Lord, this tithe, it goes to you. And make sure you, you do that. It's a little tricky today with all the digital giving and online, you know, uh, push pay and, and uh, you can make it automatic where you don't even have to think about it. I feel like in some ways you're, you're depriving yourself a little bit of the joy. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying, make a point when you're, you know, doing your budget or your finances or whatever, make sure and, and just use that as a, an opportunity to worship the Lord uh, when you're giving to the Lord. I think sometimes people miss out on some of the fun of giving. So the first day of the, of the um, you know, of the, of the week, which is Sunday, they were giving their tithe and their offering. Um, so you say, but Brett, what if we're struggling financially? Um, well, this is again, where Debbie and I, from the very beginning, it, that 10% was never mine to begin with. So your budget kind of has to reflect that. And also we've found, and so have you, that the Lord says in Philippians 4, 19, my God shall supply all your needs 
according to his riches and glory. That's a promise from God's word. And you know what's funny about this is every time I've talked about tithing, whether it's a Wednesday night or the one other time I taught a Sunday on this, I remember years ago when I first taught this, for months I had young couples coming up, Pastor Brett, you're not gonna believe it. We didn't see how this was gonna work out, giving them a tithe, but we started doing it and we changed a few things in our budget, but it was still, we didn't see how it was gonna work out. And then over and over, the Lord just kind of blessed the, you know, grandma sent a check or they got a raise at work. And I've got that story a hundred times over. Um, and, and, and it was Billy Graham who coined that phrase, you can't outgive God. I, I think he's the one who kind of first said that. Uh, Billy said this, um, you can't get around it, the scripture promises material and spiritual benefits to the man who gives to God. You cannot outgive God. I challenge you to try it and see. And, um, and I would challenge you the same thing. Um, the Lord says, I'll open up the floodgates of heaven. Um, and um, so, you know, the remedy is just, just to do it, give and see and prove, test God on this to see if this is actually gonna be true. Um, by the way, uh, how many of you know this to be true and you've tested God on this and every time when you think you're not gonna do it, somehow God works it out. How many of that happened to you, to you guys? Yeah, most of the congregation here. Um, you know, but what, what I have found is people, there's a lot of people that are still trying to scrimp and save and trying to figure out, and I'll, I'll see if I can pay my tithe if I can pay my Netflix bill. You should probably get rid of Netflix anyway, just a heads up on that one. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but it's funny how we, we prioritize and the tithing gets to be the, the blind, lame, crippled lamb like the people of Malachi. You, you gotta give the Lord the first if, if you're wanting to do it sort of with a biblical attitude. And then when you do give with a biblical attitude, that's the fourth point of our lesson today. Um, and that is number four, God's blessing on the people. And it starts at the third part of verse 10. Um, just check it out and see if not, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there won't be enough room to receive it. And verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. There's three main things the Lord says, here's what I will do if you give, he tells to the people of Malachi's time. The, the first thing he says is you'll be blessed. I'll reward you with blessing so much that you won't even be able to contain it. And man, the Lord is so good at that. And I've seen that time and time again. Um, you know, what's interesting as a just observer of church life in many years, sometimes the people are like, yeah, we're not gonna give. That's just something we don't do. Um, they're the ones that do constantly kind of seem to struggle. And they, it's not that they're not hard workers. It's just that their work doesn't really produce what they really were hoping. But the Lord says, man, test me on this. And so when you do, the Lord says, I'll take care of you. I'll reward you. And this is what you're supposed to put to test. The Lord will open the window of heaven. Then there's another phrase here that's interesting. He's not only gonna reward you, but number two, he'll rebuke the devourer. Now we're talking about an evil personality. Who's the devourer, anybody? Satan. Did you know that the devil is a devourer and he wants to, he wants to make your money not go as far as it should? Do you ever get a sense that your money's being devoured? It's probably a good time to ask that as inflation is soaring and gas prices are higher than ever in our history of our country. I'm mean, like, yeah, I feel very much like there's a devourer, but it's not Satan. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not gonna go there. But, um, but, but here the Bible says, actually Satan wants to devour um, your, your resources. Have you ever felt like uh, your money is, where does it go? Like you get a raise and you're like, oh man, we're gonna be in the money now, I got a raise. And then you, you kind of do the math and somehow your raise just kind of disappears. And you're like, I thought I got a raise, where's the extra? And you're like, oh, it's in my gas tank now. Um, or it's, you know, like it's, that's the devourer, that's, that's the normal operation of finances in, a, in sort of a godless context. But the Lord says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake if you test me on this in the area of giving. And he, then the third thing, he will not um, destroy the fruit of your ground. He actually kind of puts, I'll put it this way, he will revive your land. He says, man, listen, uh, the ground, 
Well, the fruit will not be destroyed, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, that would be the representation of their vocation of that day. They were farmers, they had vineyards, and they had you know, the ground, and, and they were at the mercy of God for rain and for good weather that the fruit wouldn't overripen too quickly and fall to the ground. And, and they were kind of at the mercy, and the Lord said, listen, if you give faithfully to me, I'll take care of the part that's out of your sphere of influence. I'll take care of the part of your income, your vocation that could be catastrophe. I'll take care of it and make sure it's fruitful and a blessing. Um, Have you ever felt like your job, your occupation is fruitless? And man, you work hard, but you don't feel like you get the reward that's due. Um, Could it be linked to this issue? The Lord says, I will rebuke the devourer and I will revive your land and make your land prosperous, speaking of your vocation. Um, And then with all that, the implication, your relationship with the Lord will be in the right place. Return to me, the Lord says, and I will return to you. Well, how do we return to you? In your tithe and offering of your giving. Um, You know, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. And put me to the test on this one and I'll bless your socks off. And true, the the law of tithing is Old Testament, but I believe the principle of giving and being a, a generous giver is something that's very much biblical and sound. So it's not a got to, nobody's cracking the whip, nobody's gonna check up on you at Athey Creek saying if you're a member at Athey Creek, we don't have membership. Why don't we have membership? Because the Bible doesn't really say churches need memberships. That's just something people made up. But it was also a way to track people who were giving. Um, And that's not my job. Uh, My job is to say, here's what the Bible says. And then your job is to say, Lord, what should I do with that? How should I respond to the idea of giving? And, uh, and I would just say, you should seek the Lord on that. Uh, but for me, I'm just gonna say for me, and this is, I'm not gonna die on this battlefield, but for me and Deb and my family, we've found tithing is one of the greatest get-tos we get to do. And I find real rejoicing. I never regret giving because I've just seen how the Lord is just so faithful. Like, like old Billy said, you can't outgive God. It's so true. Uh, and we've, we've seen that proven for decades now. The Lord has been so faithful. And I know tons of you in this room can say a big amen to that um, because you know it's true. Amen? amen? Amen. Lord, we are thankful for your provision. You have been good to us and we do have luxury. Lord, we live large here in the United States. And, and yet I also know, Lord, that sometimes the most wealthy can oftentimes be the most grouchy and sad and feeling empty. Lord, I pray that we would know how to use our resources, um, to, to, to use them as an act of worship, as an act of obedience. Lord, help us to be a church um, that is big hearted and giving, Lord. And, and I pray that you would just continue to bless Athey, Lord, you have so much. You've put this roof over our heads. Um, Lord, you've given us opportunity to do missionary work around the world. Um, to to make a difference in all the ministries here. And Lord, we're just so thankful for your provision. Um, And I'm thankful that you don't depend on any one person to try to give. (coughs) Lord, we depend on you, the owner of cattle on Thousand Hills. Um, And you are the one who provides all of our needs according to your riches in glory. So we pray blessing on your church, Lord. Uh, Speak to us. May we be obedient to your word. Lord, for those who don't know you, that aren't saved, I pray that they would give their hearts to you and accept and believe and be saved, go into heaven. (coughs) Lord, having their sins forgiven. um, I pray that today, even though this message really isn't about that, I pray that, that they would sense just the truth of the gospel and that they'd be drawn to you, Lord. So we pray this knowing you've heard our prayer now. In Jesus' name, amen.